pray for our president. We encountered some uh, technical difficulties there. I'm here today with our special guest, Sierra Takechra Russell. She's a leader in, and she's actually a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation. She is an appellate court judge. She's a leader in her community, an educator, a law professor, an appellate court judge. And she's here with us today to weigh in on a variety of issues First and foremost, we want to talk about uh, this nomination for the Supreme Court Justice and what is at stake on the Supreme Court. So I just want to open up to you, like, why does it matter uh, the type of justice that we put on the Supreme Court? Well, first of all, let me say Hanukkah, and that is thank you in Yavapai. Uh, thank you, Donna, for inviting me, and thank you, Tamara Aragon, also for your role in my being here and, and your mission to pray for the president because I'm, I'm behind our president and stand with everyone here and those who will watch this on replay. So, Hanukkah. Um, when I went to the Lord in prayer about the question um, that I figured you would ask today about what is this battle for the Supreme Court and why is it so important? What I asked God, what do you have for me to share? And I heard real clearly, as all of us know, it's a spiritual battle. <clears throat> it's a battle that's going on in the courts of heaven. And it's a battle that the Holy Spirit brought to me three words, authority, accountability, and action. And the authority that we have as his beloved children to be able to stand as ambassadors, as priests, as the, those that petition and come before the Lord with our hearts, our hearts that are united to uh, stand behind the man that God has appointed for such a time as this. I know that through this, if it weren't for this chaos in the world, if it wasn't for the division that we see so prominently in, on, in the news and in our neighborhoods and in our families, we po possibly might not be so laser focused on what is happening with the Supreme Court and why is that so important to us. So I welcome the chat to at least tell you that in God's divine plan for our world and for humanity, we are called to pray those things in heaven to earth and we're to call those down. And this is the time that we're to do that in a way that we've never done before. It's, it's not only that the president who sits in the White House as that appointed leader of the greatest nation in this country that is for such a time as this, but it is also for each one of us. Each one of us have been called in this generation to see what we are seeing and to stand as the spiritual beings we are, uh, to speak and declare God's words and encouragement for this country. Most all of us understand that when it comes to a conservative justice for the court, that we hope that the atrocities that the abortion in Roe v. Wade has brought to this country will be overturned. And it's our responsibility. That's where accountability comes in when I'm talking about accountability. Our authority are as the children and the priests of our Heavenly Father here on earth. The accountability is a responsibility, responsibility that we have to exercise our authority as his children and his priests and ambassadors and to, and to press in constantly in prayer. Why the conservative? Another value for having another conservative justice as far as it applies to indigenous people. I wanted to touch on that. The Supreme Court has not been very favorable historically to the indigenous peoples. And that is because, and that's in spite of the fact, I should say, that in um, 1828, the Supreme Court of the United States under Chief Justice Marshall made a decision in um, Worcestershire v. Georgia a powerful decision that he made the statement, if you look at the decision that said that this decision is being held in the courts of the conqueror. 
And that established this attitude of the United States court system towards the original Americans, which are the indigenous people here in the United States of America. And it set up a system or a relationship that no longer saw the first peoples as being uh, equals in this land, even though at the time that decision was made, the indigenous people held the majority of the land here. In, in fact, they owned and possessed the land here in the United States, which was not the United States at that time. But going forward, we look at where we are today. And I would say the hope for indigenous communities, even in spite of the Supreme Court not handing down decisions that have been favorable to tribal sovereignty, in 2019, July, with the majority decision being written by Justice Gorsuch, the Supreme Court decided in McGirt's v. Oklahoma, they made a decision that was a win, I would suggest, and offer to indigenous communities or the American Indian communities and Alaska Native communities here in the United States. Because he firmly stated, again, the foundation of Indian law is that Congress has, is in the Constitution and it states that Congress must and has their authority to regulate commerce with the American Indians. And that decision was a decision to uphold the foundation of a relationship that Congress has. Those are our lawmakers. And so we are hopeful that going forward with another justice such as Amy Coney Barrett, who can, uh, we, we believe, apply an originalist interpretation to the Constitution because we see Gorsuch in applying a, a textualization to the Constitution. And, and what that means is, hey, we're staying true to what we understand as the founding father's interpretation, what they were trying to protect through the Constitution. So I believe with a positive case recently, as recently as under Trump's administration, that going forward, the area that would be most impactful for tribal nations is the First Amendment. And it, it would also benefit all of our religious uh, desires to practice religion, freedom of religion, if that is upheld. And I believe it is the conservative justices that will remain true to the intent of the First Amendment, freedom of religion. So that's, that is the, the basic difference between the, the textualists, the those who honor the Constitution and those call, who call it a living document. In other words, it can be whatever we want it to be. It doesn't matter what the original uh, authors of the Constitution, doesn't matter what the original intent was, we can just kind of make it up and make it be whatever we want. And, and that gives the majority the power to uh, trample on the rights of the minority, which is exactly what our Constitution was designed to prevent. Exactly. exactly. So uh, that's why I think it is it is so critical. Um, and I think that most conservatives do understand that the Supreme Court is absolutely uh, paramount, that we have people on the Supreme Court who are not basically uh, super legislators, you know, that, that agendas that cannot pass in states, agendas that cannot get through the Congress, you know, you can't just do a, a, an end run and say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll take it to the Supreme Court and they'll kind of make up laws, you know, make up stuff that's not in the Constitution and give us what we want. I mean, isn't there like a long history of, of, of that pattern? <laughs> well, in the, and I believe that the original uh, writers, of course, of the Constitution, they were definitely influenced by the Holy Spirit in terms of writing down things that they couldn't even imagine at that time, right? They didn't know what it was going to look hundreds of years down the road to where we are. And so I believe that it, it was uh, these men whose hearts were, they were Christian men, I believe most of them were, and I I believe that they set down these words that would help us when we as other believers are in a different time and the culture, just like culture then, just like culture of the first church, 
was so uh, adverse and so anti-Christian that we would have something to hold firm to. Like we keep our Bible close, the words of the Bible, they lead us, they guide us. We don't diverge and decide we're going to, we're going to shift this part of a verse or a, an area because it, it's not fitting in with what the predominant culture is saying. And that's why we stay accountable. We stay accountable to our leadership, our, our church leaders, our trusted advisors. And it's the same thing with the Supreme in court. The, the whole concept of the Supreme Court is that they're going to have authority. However, there is also the three branches, right? We have our president. God bless our president and, and keep him safe and, and his family. And then we have Congress. And as you're talking about, Donna, the Congress are made up of a hundred or so, right? We have Congress of individuals that are elected by uh, the American citizens. And it becomes much more difficult for any idea or any ideology to be captured in a bill and then taken to Congress and then going through the shifting process where the eyes of different political views are on it and to decide whether or not that should be passed into law. And that was an important part that the founding fathers wanted to ensure that legislation or laws that will impact the whole nation, impact the whole nation and the lives cannot just come through the Supreme Court and have nine or eight or however many, a small number of appointees deciding that decision and changing the life of every citizen from there forward. And so that was the brilliance and I believe the divine guidance of our founding fathers for that. And when I say founding fathers being indigenous, no, they didn't, they weren't my directly my father a founding father in the same way. However, because I have been born into the family of believers, I see it from a spiritual perspective. Well, that's really beautiful. So I, I, there are actually three issues that I wanted to talk with you with everybody who's maybe tuning in now. My guest today is Sierra Teketra Russell. She is a, an appellate court judge. She's a graduate of Harvard University and UC Berkeley Law School. And uh, she's giving us kind of her perspective as an appellate court judge, a woman on the bench. You know it is. I mean, I'm sure you're sitting on the bench and someone's in front of you and you'd like to, you'd, you'd like to do it your way, but you have to apply the law. You know, you don't get to just make it up on the fly. You have to apply the law. And it's remarkable to me that somehow the Supreme Court uh, just kind of gets to make it up sometimes. Um, she has just written a brand new autobiography and uh, it's right next to the glorious uh, RBG, right? You've got her biography and then right next to it, uh, at least in one of the categories, it's called Rising Above Opioid Addiction. And so I wanna, I wanna talk next about opioid and I wanna talk a little bit about your life story. You know, Sierra, I met you uh, in person and you're so beautiful and articulate, Harvard graduate, appellate court judge, so accomplished leader in your uh, tribal community, founder, indigenous mentors, just this incredibly impressive woman. And then I start finding out your story that you went into this dark, dark place of where well, you come out of a dark place and into opioid addiction out of that. I think people are gonna be stunned. I want you to tell them a little about your journey because it's a reminder that in America, you can rise above anything and and make your comeback it's such a story of redemption when you just tell us a little bit and, and by the way people you can get her book it is she's making it available free today on amazon kindle and you can go to donnaparto.com forward slash rising donnaparto.com forward slash rising and you will not be able to put the book down i get a copy of it i could not put it down but just tell us a little bit about your your journey <laughs> well thank you donna uh, a little bit about my journey my journey is is just the most um, amazing tale of uh, God touching a life, not letting go of me from the moment that I accepted him as a little girl. And staying with me, uh, never, never forcing, of course, God doesn't change anybody's will, so I couldn't change the home environment I was raised in. However, through all the tragedies of the 
a child abuse that I experienced. And I do lay out a couple of those situations in the book. Um, through it all, though, there was always a sense of um, I'm not alone. And I would say, Donna, that my book, definitely, this story is a story for with God, all things are possible. It is clearly what is the theme in this story that God put on my heart a long, long time ago. And in, in spite of the abuse, in spite of the, the a residual drug addiction, because I was searching for a sense of esteem, searching, I didn't feel valuable. I felt, uh, I felt no worth. Uh, yet God blessed me with this brain that just could soak up things. And I found safety. I found safety in school and thank God for that. And so I was compelled to continue to fight for get up off of the ground and get up, brush myself off and keep going. And that led me to uh, some excellent opportunities in education. And But the most important thing is that I sit here today as your, your guest, very humbled by the opportunity to have a, a book, like you say, and that is in a bestseller. And, and it's because of what the Lord wants to say. And that is, he wants to say that there is nothing, no valley that is too deep, no um, choice that we've made that is so shameful. There is no uh, relationship that is so broken. And there is no hope that is so gone that can't be restored and transformed with, uh, with his love and his touch. You know, it was really touching to me. And I, I, my family has a lot of addiction. I myself, I think, you know, I was a, a cocaine addict before I came to Christ and many people in my family battled with addiction. I have some people I think but right now, but these opioids, it just, it, it, when I read your book, it was like they haunted your steps. They kept trying, you know, you, you had this daily, almost daily battle of, am I going to be this woman that you knew God was calling you to be a leader for your tribe? Because if people know some of the circumstances you live in the Southwest, that there is a lot of oppression and a lot of obstacles for the indigenous people there. And there's a lot of just dysfunction. I, if you want to talk about that, but you felt called by God to be a leader, you know, to go on to Harvard, go on to law school, to set the example. And as you are now be a leader in that community, but it was like those opioids were, were, were haunting your steps and constantly trying to beckon you back in. And I wonder if you could just maybe say some words of encouragement encouragement to somebody who's listening. They're, they're praying for America. They're praying for our country. Um, I, I think I would like maybe talk to two issues. One, just talk to them personally, if, if they or someone they know are battling these opioids. And then second, I'd love you to address why Trump is so important in this battle against opioids, which as we know, come out of China <laughs> and through our Southern border. And I don't think people realize that, that this may, this these, this may be an intentional poisoning of our people. And I, I just wonder if you want to speak to both of those things. Well, thank you. I wrote this book because I wanted my daughter, my granddaughter, and then the, the descendants that I'll not see, but will, that should come. I wanted them to know that there is hope that hope is more than a pie in the sky type of um, uh, thought. It is an actual reality in a life that uh, chooses to stay, um, to press into God. So if you have uh, a loved one that is struggling or, and, or maybe it's you, there is nothing that the addict has done that it get God won't forgive. There is nothing that you've done that caused the addict to be in this situation. It is uh, something that it, it grips a person's heart and its and their soul. And we can pray for that loved one. We can pray 
for their deliverance. We can pray that God will change the circumstances of their life so that they are brought to the place where they actually have nothing else but the Lord and the Lord will meet them where they're at. If we step out of the way and let God and we put aside what ifs, what if I had done, what did I do? And instead we just say, Lord, let me pray your love and life into this person. I tell you, there is, if God can take someone with the type of destruction that was in my life and the type of uh, bad tapes I had playing in my mind, oh my, he loves you. And that would be my gift to you. That's a, it's a really a, a very, very compelling story. Um, even after you, you go to Harvard and you, you know, you've broken out of so much dysfunction and pain and you're living the you know, American dream. And uh, even after that, it, it, it catches you again. It sucks you in. It's sometimes for some people, there, there are seasons where it's like, it just keeps bringing you back and, and bringing you back. And you had to contend for that healing. And I, I just don't think that people realize how powerful these drugs are that are coming into our country. I mean, it just, now it's like you can take one, one drug and you're dead, like this, the fentanyl and some of these, I mean, they are so deadly. I mean, so incredibly deadly and people are dying. And I know that the rate in the indigenous community is, is really high as well. Yeah, let me speak to, there was another question that you had asked me to address, and that was about Trump. And why is President yeah. Trump uh, important in this fight, this opioid crisis? So I wanted to just say earlier when we started this um, this session, uh, Donna, you made, you talked about, you know, this is a historic uh, day in, in many ways and about the prayer that went on in DC just this past weekend. And all you said like close to 75,000 believers showed up and joined together in a, a collaboration. And I just want to say to uh, your viewers is that imagine if you had a chance to see that on TV and see those people, all those souls on the, uh, the White House lawns, on the Lincoln Memorial, it was so impressive. Well, that's about the number of souls that died because of, the, of a drug overdose in 2018. Wow. That's how many succumbed. 128 souls a day pass away due to drug over, overdose. And of those numbers of 128, the majority of those numbers are due to opioid. And so they're the major driver in drug overdose is opioids. And what Trump is doing is that in uh, in 2019, in fact, let me just share something with you. Um, hold on one second, I have it right here in my notes. Um, well, in 2017, President Trump, he declared the opioid crisis a national health emergency. And in 2018, our President Trump launched the quote, call to action on the world drug problem at the United Nations and 130 nations agree to this. He has, uh, he has allowed millions of dollars to go into uh, the states and um, to fight and, and, and tribal communities have also had access to those funds as well. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion sometime to talk about the parody. But the point of this is that President Trump, and especially his first lady, the first lady Melania, has made this a priority, has kept it in the public eye. And that's critical to helping because we can pray for our loved ones. We, as a person that suffer from opioid uh, drugs, can also ask for help and reach out. And then there is what we do as citizens of the United States of America, and that is to make sure that our vote and our voices are part of, as well as our prayers, in ensuring that someone like a leader like Trump, who really understands this, not, not just as a, um, a lip service, but as action. And that's where I was talking about authority, accountability, and action. And the action against China, China is one of the biggest uh, they're, they're out to get us. And Absolutely. you know, they are out to get us. And now that's something that 
uh, indigenous communities understand that concept that there is there is someone trying to take away our way of life. Well, for indigenous communities, it did happen. And that at some point, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about how that looks to indigenous communities. But what the what China is doing is, is deliberately sending across in any way they can. There's several wars that are going on with China, but we're talking about the drug war right now, but there's a lot of wars with China and they are infiltrating our community, our, our, our way of life with fentanyl, as you had said. Why are opioids so bad? Because opioids, synthetic opioids right now are uh, what you find in fentanyl, which the, the uh, devastation, the uh, toxicity, the poisonness of fentanyl is beyond what you can understand. I can't come talk to it, but I can say this, if, I, if a fentanyl was widely available when I was a heroin addict, You'd be dead. I would not be here today. No I, would doubt. Be gone I, I agree with you completely. And, and I, I, I know we talked about this prior to uh, today. This is intentional. And I think Trump is one of the few leaders in this country who understands that this is deliberate. There was, we're talking about, I think it was the 1800s, the famous opium wars. People can go to Wikipedia, look up opium wars. The British, God bless them, you know, the British deliberately flooded China with cheap opium deliberately to drug the Chinese people as an act of war. I go. Well, um, this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is a fact of history. And Trump is one of the very few people who realizes this is China's revenge on the West, that they are deliberately following that same play playbook. This is the fentanyl war. They are deliberately flooding this country with all of these toxic drugs to destroy our way of life, to destroy our country. And you probably could speak to that with indigenous people. Did they not give you alcohol and stuff like that? And it's it is an act of war and trump i don't i don't think does anyone other than trump see that i i don't well, you know that. it goes to the the greed aspect what greed. are our leadership in, in people that have power that are in political positions if you were to dig deep and maybe not that deep you would find the connection to these big chinese corporations where they're getting some type of consulting or contractual money so why it would be cutting their own nose to spit their face kind of concept right i think that's how you all say that <laughs> and so uh right it's it's um it's exactly what the lord talked about greed and and why that is just uh at the root of it's just evil yeah, you know, it used to be the, the drugs that were coming in, as you were talking about, you know, uh, would obviously they're very destructive, but now they're, they're just deadly and, and so quickly leading to so many deaths. And I, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory to say that we are in a war and very few people realize it. I just, for those of you joining us, I want to go ahead and say that uh, you're uh, here on Pray for Our President. We are going to pray for our president. We have a very special guest today. This is Sierra Tkachera. How did I do? Tkachera Russell. She's a citizen of the Yavapai Apache uh, Nation. And also, so are you a dual citizen? I'm, oh, thank you for asking, Donna. How does I that work? Okay, this is how it works. I am a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation. Yes, my father and mother were both. Uh, uh, my father Yavapai and my, uh, my adopted mother was of Apache descent, but they both were enrolled in the Yavapai Apache Nation. The reason why it's Yavapai Apache, two different Indian nations, the federal government did that. Uh, anyway, we'll go on. And so I am also a citizen of Arizona. Yes, Arizona. And so because I was, I was, I am a, I'm living here, I reside here in Arizona, so that makes me a citizen of Arizona. Also, my people are originally from the Sedona Oak Creek Canyon area. That's our original homeland. Gorgeous. And then thirdly, I am a citizen of the United States of America. Wow. So you get, that, that's fascinating. You're a a dual citizen, at least. And by the way, I forgot to mention, you're also on the board uh, for the Indian Bible College and love to hike the state parks. I, I want to come out and see you. I do love Sedona. That area of the country is so beautiful and come out and, and hike with you and see you there. Uh, and Sierra is making available her brand new autobiography. Uh, it's number one on Amazon. She's right next to RGB in, in, in multiple categories. But uh, you can read the amazing story of her life 
from growing up on indigenous role, a tremendous amount of childhood abuse, neglect. Um, it's really some sad, hard stuff. All the way to Harvard University, UC Berkeley, law school, an appellate court judge, founder of Indigenous Mentors, and a beautiful sister in Christ. We're really honored to have her here with us today. And I would encourage you, the book is available free. If you're enjoying me, uh, we're live today in Pray for Our President on October 1st. And for October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, you'll be able to get a copy of it for free on um, Kindle, Amazon Kindle. And you can go to DonnaParto.com forward slash rising. Um, I know your daughter is a Trump fanatic. I mean, she's the one. Is she like walking around <laughs> like with outfits and stuff? She's passionate uh, Trump supporter. Oh, that's right. She's an inspiration for sure. <laughs> she's bold. <laughs> she's fearless, I'll tell you. Uh, and I, I am a supporter of this president. President as well. I've shared many times I didn't vote for him uh, the last time around because I was living overseas and uh, and didn't uh, didn't put in the effort. I regret it now. I sh should put in the effort to get the absentee ballot. But anyway, we're here now and we are praying for him. Um, are there any other issues? We've talked about the Supreme Court, the importance of reelecting Trump to keep getting wonderful nominees like Gorsuch, like Kavanaugh, like Amy Coney Barrett, people who will stick to the divinely inspired constitution. I agree with you that God really Really was with his people as they prepared that document. We've, uh, we want to elect Trump, uh, both of the uh, former drug addicts. We understand there's a war with, um, with China over opium. I don't know, as a, someone from Arizona, do you have an opinion about the border, what's coming over the border? Does that affect indigenous people at all? Or Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I can speak to that from my own personal uh, walking and drug addiction. And, and uh, I used to, and I don't, I didn't realize it until more recently, as I began to think more for, from a, not thinking about it in terms of I can't wait to get high, but like thinking about it in terms of where has God brought me and and what is going on now in our societies with regards to drug and the accessibility? And when I was heavy into my cocaine uh, time, when that just seemed to, that took over my thinking, um, and I was uh, living down in the Phoenix area, I would personally go uh, into uh, neighborhoods and I would work, uh, not work, I would buy directly from um, illegal aliens that had, I mean, I didn't look for their green card and ask them, do you have a green card before I buy my drugs? <laughs> it was like, I knew because they, they couldn't, they didn't speak a lot of English and just in terms of um, some of the connections they had. And so, you know, it was like, for me, it was great. So I could find uh, what I needed to. And then as I, years down the road, when I look at that, I think, oh my gosh, all of that, those connections, all of those drug dealers that I interfaced with um, were definitely connected. It's probably part of a cartel, very low, low, low level of the cartel. Mm -hmm. And so I know the, the back and forth across the border. And, and it's been such an easy thing to do years ago. So with the putting up the wall and the focus on securing our borders, it is critical. It is critical to the the safety of our lifestyles because going back to what China is trying to do and 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 what whatever evil organizations that are planted in, in neighboring countries or countries that are across the ocean the intent is to undermine and to destroy the way of life that we hold dear because we have in America we have this uh, mandate and I believe from God for uh, life liberty pursuit of happiness that comes from God and to stand as a beacon of hope for the whole world and the only way we can do that is if we protect what God has blessed us with one nation under God and that's what we have well wow. and then uh, just one final thing and then we'll go ahead and, and pray um, I, I lived in Arizona many years as well, and I know that one of your passions is the national parks and the land and, and, and your love for the land. And the other thing that not many people realize is the destruction of the land when people are coming in illegally, just the litter. I remember as a little girl, 
of course, you know, had the, the famous commercial, the, the native guy and he's crying because of all the litter. Do you remember that? Really? Oh my, we remember, oh my, and that nobody wanted to litter because we made him cry, <laughs> right? And, but different, and that really is a remarkable thing about, we don't litter. Uh, but when you go to other cultures, they just litter. And that's like a huge thing, just the destruction of the natural environment, the deserts, uh, all of that region. It just, it's being destroyed as people trample over it and stash drugs. And it's amazing to me that the environmentalists are not in favor of securing the border, even just as a way to protect the environment. Mm, right. I <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this from people who, Absolutely, Northern, absolutely, especially the further south you go. It's just, and they're going to the, na the national parks and the state parks and just trash them. <laughs> anyway, so this has been a wonderful, wonderful interview. I don't know if there's anything else, else that you want to add, and then we want to pray for our president. Anything else on your heart? I if I have a, a couple of minutes, there is something yeah. on my heart. Go, go for it. Oh, well, you know, as I was uh, in prayer, what and that's what is so fantastic and so important about this uh, group is that we pray. We pray for the president, and I know we're praying for other things in our lives as well. But our focus is on the president because we know what it means and we know what this costs. Our freedom to worship. Our freedom to religion is critical. And that's why we need the, the Supreme Court to have justices that will stand up for the Constitution as far as the First Amendment is concerned. And if you think about what has happened in just like March, what happened to all of us um, at maybe a different day, but all of a sudden it went from life as we knew it to what? We can't do what? We can't leave our house. We're ordered to shelter in home. We're ordered to, we're mandated to do this and that. And like that, like dominoes, our liberties are taken away. And what I wanted to say is that is the picture of what happened to the indigenous people of this land. One day they were living as, as, as what was their way of life. And the next day it was taken away. Abruptly, their way of life culture, religion, everything was ripped from them. And yet today, and today they are still coming from that place of what happened? How do we become who God intended us to be? It's the same, it's a picture or it's experience that I hope everyone who hears this will be able to have a little bit of an understanding of why it is so hard for the indigenous people today to come back in some areas because that sense of who they were has to be reformed because their right to freedom and religion and all those ways were taken away from them in so many levels. So, so it's I want a warning. It's a warning to it's us. It's a warning as well because if the Native American communities are able to get uh, respect and honor for their right to practice their religion as they want to, that's going to protect Christianity as well. And that's the First Amendment. The First Amendment. This has been so powerful and so insightful um, to hear from you and just as a sister in Christ, as a, a dual citizen, as a leader in your community, as a judge, just is so on time to have you here this week. And we've just been so blessed. For those of you just joining us, I'm Donna Parteau. I'm the founder of Pray for Our President, and we're going to do that right now. And my guest this week was uh, Sierra Tiketra Russell, and she's a dual citizen of the the Yavapai Apache Nation and the United States of America. And she's here as someone who's living the American dream, uh, came from an extremely abusive childhood through opioid addiction, abusive relationships, uh, went on to Harvard University, UC Berkeley Law School, um, founder of Indigenous Mentors, helping, giving her life to helping other Indigenous 
uh, I know mostly women, men too, but you know, helping other indigenous, the next generation to rise up and here to really just warn all of us, you know, we can lose something great if we don't fight. And we've got to fight. I know, I know some of us are not happy with Trump after that debate performance, but we, you know, we just got to keep praying, keep praying and uh, just believing and pressing in. So I'm going to let you go ahead and pray if there's a prayer on your heart for our president and then I'll close in prayer. And then hopefully Tamara is still here and she'll be able to come back and uh, just wrap up and give away some Trump swag. Does that sound great? That sounds great. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are just in awe of how great and loving you are. We thank you, Lord, for this movement to pray in a united way, Father, for the President of the United States of America. We pray for his protection, for his wisdom. We pray, Father, for the power, Father, that you have imbued him with because of the authority that he carries, the mantle of leadership, as he is the president, the leader of the greatest nation in this world. We thank you because this is a, a nation, Father, and he is your appointed president. And we honor him and we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you sit on the throne and that, Father, we trust you. We are doing exactly what you called us to do as ambassadors in this world, Lord, in our families, in our communities. And we pray, Father, for the leadership. We pray for wisdom, Father, and for peace and protection over our leaders. All those who call you Lord, Father, we pray that their authority would be even increased, Father, and that the wise words that come from you, Lord God, come out of their mouths to encourage and to move us forward, Father. We speak peace. We speak blessings to every person who's listening, Father. We pray calm. We say, oh, no more addiction, no more suicide, no more broken hearts, Father, no more loneliness, that turn the hearts to you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Oh, so beautiful. Lord, I just thank you for the life of my sister and what an example. She's an example that there is hope, that you can begin anywhere, begin anew, and become a mighty, mighty force for good and making a difference in this world. We thank you also that her story is a warning that a way of life can be lost and that we need to guard the treasure. I think of what you, uh, I believe it was Timothy, uh, Paul said to Timothy, guard the treasure. And of course, the word of God is the ultimate treasure. The Holy Spirit within us is the ultimate treasure. But the freedoms that we have in this nation our First Amendment, all of the Constitution. It is a gift and it is a treasure. It is also a treasure. Yes. And we need to guard it and to guard the way of life and to guard our nation, to secure our borders, to secure the Supreme Court, mm. secure the Supreme Court and guard the treasure of that Constitution. So God, we pray that you would be with our president and uh, be, with, be with Americans as they make these big, big, big decisions, big decisions. Would you guard the integrity of the election? Would you guard the integrity of the election as well? We love you, God, and we thank you for this opportunity to pray to you. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Sierra. Everybody, go get, you can get it free on Amazon Kindle, DonnaParto.com forward slash rising. Her autobiography uh, is incredible. You won't be able to put it down. Rising above opioid addiction what's the subtitle in an indigenous woman's story of childhood abuse faith and healing powerful it's about faith hope and love you will really really be blessed and we've been blessed by your uh your beautiful gentle spirit and and i I, I've really taken heart what you've said to me. I, I think the thing that stuck with me the, the most is that a way of life can be lost and, uh, and it's happened on the soil. So um, it's a sober warning, but also we walk away with hope 
because you are living proof that we serve the God of the impossible. Girl, 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 we can rescue you and take you all the way to Harvard and Berkeley and Judge and you're just amazing. It's so encouraging. So hopefully, Tamara, are you going to be able to hop back on and announce? Yeah, I am. Can, can you see Yay! me okay? Am I here? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm here. Um, yeah, so I can see why uh, we've had some we've had some weird uh, Zoom stuff today, but I'm here, and I just that was so amazing. My heart's just moved. Um, Sierra, you've always touched my heart. I think I put that on my post earlier, and I just um, you really moved me for the heart of the indigenous people and your direction. And I just thank you for your passion for that and for sharing it. And um, the book is Rising Above Opioid Addiction, an indigenous woman's story of, um, hold on a second. I want to get the exact title because I think you said something different than what I saw it to be. And I want to keep playing. An indigenous woman's story of childhood trauma, faith, and healing. Childhood trauma, faith, and healing. And so even though I'm not an indigenous, indigenous person, I found it to be a book about hope and overcoming and I uh, you're giving it away free today is that what I understood today October 1st yes is free. after that you might have to pay a little bit but well worth the spend so thank you thank you so much and I have to end but with uh, giving a little gift because we did have some participation and in fact uh, our little Trump swag I usually have it in my hand uh, is going to Cheryl Smith today and Cheryl Smith is also the newest buyer of your book. So she also shared your book. So I thought, well, you know, that was coincidental. I throw darts, close my eyes and landed right on her name. So I'll be uh, sending her a message and getting her address and mailing out her gift. So thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us here today. Please hit the share button if you found this at all impactful. Uh, we wanna gather as many as we can together to pray for America, to pray for our president. Um, and in closing, is there anything else to add, Donna? This was just incredible. I, I, my heart is so deeply moved within me. And I, 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 yeah, share, 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 share. There are so many people who need to hear this message. It was really, we've had some incredible guests, but I've got to say that today was pretty, pretty special. I, my heart is deeply moved by what she shared. She's and Donna, special. how do they, uh, people stay notified of when we have these prayer times? Uh, well, you do, of course, join the Pray for Our President Facebook group, Pray for Our President Facebook group. They can go to Trump, oh boy, TrumpPrayerTrain.com, TrumpPrayerTrain.com, TrumpPrayerTrain.com. Got it. Yeah, because I'm always a little worried that Facebook- oh, That's really right. hard to say, TrumpPrayerTrain.com and get Yeah, I'm always a little worried that uh, Facebook group- might breaking up. So I want you to, if you <clears throat> want to stay in touch where we can- regroup if we ever have to go to trumpprayertrain.com and stick your email in there you won't get a bunch of spam i promise uh we just want to stay in touch and keep praying for america and praying for our president thank you donna for your heart for our country and for others to to be so diligent you have no idea anybody listening that the work and time and passion that this woman puts into this group volunteering her time for this and I just am so grateful for you, Donna, for all that you do for, for all of us. So and I love you. I love you. See how that works? Yeah. You know what? We just wanted to bless America. I mean, you know, Sierra's story, your story, my story. I mean, we are three women right here who've been through it. I mean, we, uh, we have been through so much in our lives lives. And yet because of the freedom in this great nation, here we are together from very different backgrounds uh, because of our love of Jesus and the freedom that we have in this nation. And it is a treasure and it is worth guarding and our way of life is worth fighting for. And if you didn't get that today, you need to re-listen because it hit me at the deepest level today. And uh, we just love everybody. We're glad you're here. Pray for our president. Pray for our president. Pray for America. Pray for our president. See you next week. Oh, we have a big guest next oh, week. Oh, we have a big guest next week. Not, not as big as Sierra, but not as big as but he didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> you know, but we have Madison Cawthorn next week. 
with us, Madison Cawthorn is the young man. He'll be the youngest. When he wins, he'll be the youngest member of Congress in 200 years. He is the young man who is left paraplegic after a severe car accident, and he just stole everybody's hearts at the RNC convention, and mm -hmm. uh, we're really honored. We're going to have him as our guest next week, mm -hmm. and that'll be another inspiring story of why this nation is worth preserving. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.